Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our latest History Room on Zoom. I'm Brenda Schufelt, the library's History Room Coordinator, and um, this is a very special collaboration with the Jacob Leisler Institute for the Study of Early New York History. Uh, that institute, for anybody who doesn't know, is located in Hudson, New York, so if you're in the area, you could visit them. Um, our Hudson Area Library has a history room that's dedicated to preserving and making accessible to the public the history of Hudson, Greenport, and Stockport. We have online research requests that you can go to our website to get, um, and they are absolutely free. They're a service to the public. Anyone that wishes to donate to the library's history room and to the Leisler Institute you can visit our website at hudsonarialibrary.org. So I'm gonna introduce David Voorhees, who's the founder and director of the Jacob Leisler Institute. And he's also the director of the Jacob Leisler Papers Project that was formerly located at New York University, as well as the Jacob Leisler Institute headquartered in Hudson. He's also managing editor of De Havamon, the Half Moon, a quarterly scholarly journal published by the Holland Society of New York. And I think there's a new edition coming out. He can tell you that. Um, he's an NYU, New York University research scientist and a former managing reference history editor at Charles Scribner's and Sons. And he has published numerous historical works and articles and been a consultant on historical exhibits at the Museum of the City of New York and the Bard Center in Manhattan, among others. So David, would you like to introduce our speaker for tonight? Thank you, Brenda. It was with deep appreciation that the Jacob Leiser Institute is again thanking the Hudson Area Library for hosting this fourth lecture in the Institute's 2021 lecture series. This series devoted to the English colonial period in New York is partially made possible through the generous support of the Van Dyke Family Foundation. It is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Noah Galfan. Dr. Galfan holds a PhD in Atlantic history from New York University and is currently a doctoral lecturer in the history department at Hunter College. 20 years ago, Noah was also a student intern with the Jacob Leisler Papers Project, then located within the NYU History Department. And to my great pleasure was 20 years later, elected a trustee to the Jacob Leisler Institute Board. Dr. Galfand's presentation on the Jewish community in colonial New York this evening highlights the Institute's commitment that the valuable contributions of all the peoples who created the vibrant culture of colonial New York will be preserved and heard. Noah? Uh, thank you, David. And thanks for reminding us uh, how long it's been since, uh, since I was at NYU, uh, making us all feel old. But thanks uh, to the um, Hudson uh, Area Library for, for um, inviting me and allowing me to talk tonight about uh, the Jewish Atlantic world. And, and thank you all for, for registering and, and showing up to hear this talk. And so today, New York State is home to 1.6 million Jews, which is about 21% of the estimated 7.6 million Jewish people in the United States. Significantly, New York State has the largest Jewish population in the world outside of Israel. And by most measures, religious, economic, cultural, social, New York is the center of Judaism in the Western Hemisphere. Typically, uh, the, the rise to prominence of New York as a capital for, um, for Jewish people is traced to the 19th century when um, German Jews migrated to New York in significant numbers, resulting in as many as 80,000 Jews living in New York State by 1880. And then in the next 40 year period from the 1880s to uh, the early 1920s, uh, saw a massive emigration of Jews from Eastern Europe to the United States. And many of those people made New York State their long-term home. Um, in the early modern era though, New York and North America in general uh, was slow to develop as a destination for Jewish people. 
For much of the 17th century, South America and the Caribbean were the preferred locations for intrepid European Jews and crypto Jews looking to relocate to the Americas. Uh, the reasons for this were myriad, but included the ability to practice their religion openly in Dutch Brazil, Curaçao, Suriname, and business opportunities that flowed through extended kin networks of Sephardim in the empires of the Iberian nations. However, in the last third of the 17th century, circumstances began to change in, in the Atlantic world for Jews, in part due to their own efforts, and New York did emerge as a place for them to live, engage in commerce, and worship. In 1695, a map of New York City indicated that a building was being utilized as a synagogue, and by the 1720s, as many as 30 Jewish families called New York their home. These Jews and those that came after them until the British occupation of New York City during the American Revolution turned New York into the most important location for Jews, both economically and religiously, in North America during the 18th century, with New York eventually even rival, rivaling Curacao uh, as a center for Judaism in the Atlantic world as a whole. Tonight's talk explores this community's formation uh, and their activities in linking New York to other communities in North America and communities throughout the Atlantic world, ultimately laying the foundations for New York's subsequent uh, paramount place in, uh, in Jewish history. Um, I should add that yeah. most of, of my discussion is New York City centered, but as you'll hear, there are times when, uh, when New York's Jews are uh, conducting business, um, moving, establishing locations uh, in the Hudson River Valley, in Albany, um, in the 18th century, even Westchester and Long Island. Um, but overall, um, it's mostly New York City centric. An important precursor to the expanded Jewish presence in colonial New York was the readmission of Jews to England. Jews had been expelled from uh, England in 1290 during the reign of Edward I. And the story of readmission involved the convergence of 17th century religious and commercial agendas. In 1655, influential Amsterdam rabbi Manasseh ben Israel undertook a journey to London to meet with Oliver Cromwell about allowing Jews to settle in England. Both Manasseh ben Israel and Oliver Cromwell were attracted to millenarian uh, ideas of their age. For Ben Israel, readmission of Jews to England would continue their dispersal to the four corners of the world, a key step in bringing uh, about the coming of the Messiah. Cromwell, on the other hand, thought bringing Jews to England would spiegel, speed along their conversion to Christianity, which was a necessary step before the second coming of Christ. Cromwell was also interested in promoting England's overseas commerce and believed the widespread trade connections and special competencies of the European Sephardim, evident in the Netherlands' commercial success, would be beneficial to England's economy as well. Some English merchants and ministers, however, voiced their opposition to the readmission of Jews on economic, on religious grounds. So ultimately, a compromise position was reached regarding Jewish settlement in England, with Cromwell adopting an unofficial readmission policy. Jewish merchants could apply directly to him, and then after the restoration to the crown for denization status, and thus live in England and trade legally within the English Atlantic. Uh, at least 90 Sephardic Jews took the step between 1655 and 1680. At around the same time, Ashkenazi Jews from Central Europe migrated to England uh, by way of Hamburg and Amsterdam. By 1720, when the Spanish and Portuguese congregation in London dedicated a new synagogue for public worship, there were over 1,000 Sephardic Jews living there. 
uh, at least as many Ashkenazim were also worshiping in their synagogue in London, which they called the Great Synagogue at this time. And uh, here on the slide, you can see a photo of uh, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue that was built in 1720 uh, in London. The other crucial development uh, in the 17th century that spurred, uh, spurred the development of New York's uh, Jewish community was the English conquest of New Netherland in 1664. Previously under the Dutch, New Netherland had been a marginal location in the Jewish diaspora to the Americas. From 1654 to 1664, a few Jewish people, some refugees, other intentional migrants lived in the Dutch colony. But by the time the English took over, seemingly only one family remained, the now famous Levies, Asser and Miriam. New Netherland becoming New York made it possible for Jewish entrepreneurs both in London and in Amsterdam to envision making New York a base from which to take advantage of changing opportunities in the Atlantic world. In the second half of the 1660s, trade ties already linked New York City to Curacao. And as Jewish communities formed in Barbados, London, Jamaica, Suriname, and other Atlantic locations, some Jewish merchants saw potential in New York to play a role in the provisioning trade that supplied the crash crop, cash crop plantation colonies with food. Because New Amsterdam was now New York City and an English port, Jewish merchants could adhere to the navigation acts which regulated trade and legally engage with the developing English Atlantic while still managing uh, to illegally traffic through their kin-based trade networks with partners in Dutch, French, and Spanish locations. So the, the readmission of Jews to England and New York becoming English combined to enlarge the scope of Jewish entrepreneurial oper operations uh, from long established sort of Amsterdam, Iberian Peninsula, Caribbean, South American routes uh, to now a new London North American axis as well. Additional economic factors that made colonial New York an attractive place for commercially minded settlers in the late 17th century included New York's emergence as a burgeoning port in the transatlantic slave trade and the economic boom associated with imperial wars. Uh, one, for example, in the 1690s was King William's War, that uh, wars that uh, England and, and then Great Britain uh, were involved in coming out of the 17th century and then in the 18th century uh, generated um, um, good economic times often in North American ports. In 1676, four Jews appeared in the city's uh, tax list and then around 10 families uh, had at least some type of residence in the town by the end of the 1670s. By the 1680s, a number of additional Jews had migrated to New York City and begun to form what we can consider to be a permanent community. Significantly, it's from this period that the oldest Jewish tombstone survives in New York. 18 Jewish families consistently resided in the city by the end of the 1680s. By the turn of the century, at least 20 families are there in New York and a public congregation definitely has formed. For these Jews, establishing residency and gaining licenses to trade as Englishmen was of paramount importance. A whole series of records have been preserved in the archives de detailing the efforts of early New York Jews to secure privileges to traffic goods in the English colony. A few examples. David Brown received a license from Governor Thomas Dongan in October 1684, which stated that, quote, by virtue of the power derived unto me, I do hereby give liberty and license to Mr. David Brown, now resident in this city, merchant, to trade traffic, buy and sell, as the rest of the inhabitants within this city and government. Another document, just a couple of years later, uh, uh, to, by uh, Governor Dongan, grant, granted residency status 
and importantly, commercial and property privileges to Jewish merchant Isaac de Costa. Accordingly, in August 1686, Dongan wrote, whereas Isaac de Costa having an intent to trade in these parts hath requested of me that he may be a free denizen of this his majesty's colony for an encouragement to merchants and others who are willing to settle or traffic unto these parts, know ye that by virtue of the commission and authority unto me given, I do declare and confirm him, the said Isaac de Costa, to be a free denizen of this colony. And he, having by virtue of these letters of denization, the privileges and power to purchase, receive, and take, have, hold, buy, occupy, possess, and enjoy any lands, tenements, and hereditaments uh, within the government, and them may give, sell, align, and bequeath as he shall see cause. And the said Isaac de Casa hath likewise liberty and freedom to trade or traffic in this place or any other of his majesties without any manner of let, hindrance, or molestation whatsoever. Thus, with these letters from Governor Dongan, David Brown, Isaac de Costa, and many other of uh, contemporary co-religionists uh, were free to explore economic opportunities in New York and the greater English Atlantic world at the turn of the century. As their mercantile community developed in New York in the 18th century, prior to 1740, Jews living in the colony could then petition the General Assembly for naturalization. This is in the 18th century. Uh, Jewish merchants, Abraham, a merchant, Abraham uh, de Caceres, for example, petitioned the assembly for naturalization in 1718. The assembly thus passes a bill, forwards it to Governor Robert Hunter, who signed his assent in July 1718, naturalizing Abraham de Caceres. Uh, after um, Parliament passed uh, the uh, Plantation Act of 1740, Jews living in the colonies, the North American colonies, for seven years could take an oath of naturalization. Isaac Adolphus, for example, uh, a merchant and a professing Jew, did, uh, did just that in uh, July 1758 after having resided in Rhode Island, Connecticut, and New York. So having acquired the privileges and freedoms to live and trade during the late 17th and first half of the 18th centuries, Jewish merchants engaged in a dizzying array of business endeavors with both Jewish and Christian partners throughout the Atlantic world. In the process, they carved out a space for themselves in New York and helped make the colony an important hub in the transatlantic commercial economy of Europe. Some of New York's Jewish, wealthiest Jewish merchants uh, and settlers are likely known to many of you that are, are, are tuning in uh, tonight. Um, the Gomezes, uh, headed by Patriarch Louis Moses Gomez, are one such well-known 18th century New York mercantile family. Born to new Christian parents, Isaac and Esther Gomez, in Madrid, Spain, sometime between 1654, 1660, his family relocated to France, apparently because uh, they needed to escape from the Inquisition. Um, eventually, Lewis and his family moved from France to London, uh, where they were able to outwardly profess uh, their, um, uh, their faith in Judaism. At some point in the late 1680s, Lewis migrated to the West Indies, possibly for a time uh, he lived in Barbados, certainly he lived in Jamaica, um, and was there for a number of years before eventually settling in New York. While in Jamaica, Lewis married Esther Marquez. The couple had four sons, Jacob, Mordechai, Daniel, and David. Uh, and then they had two more sons, Isaac and Benjamin, who were born in New York. On April 18, 1705, Lewis Moses Gomez, who had been in New York City since at least 1703, was officially declared a denizen. Less than a year later, he was listed in the records as a freeman of the city. In New York, Luis Gomez initially set up a retail shop that sold goods from Europe and the Caribbean. 
over the course of the first half of the 18th century, uh, he and his sons expanded their operation by opening additional stores and handling commodities from all over the world that were imported on ships that they owned, which I think is significant to point out. Um, by 1714, New York governor Robert Hunter wrote that the Gomez's were all, quote, persons of considerable trade and commerce in the colony. The Gomez family sustained their success in part by continuing longstanding Jewish mercantile practices. Like their Jewish predecessors involved in the Atlantic trade, they typically conducted their commercial transactions in distant ports through networks of co-religionist brokers, some of whom were relatives. For example, Daniel Gomez sent over 100 ships from New York City to Curacao, all consigned to Jewish correspondents there. Louis Moses Gomez also utilized the time-honored practice of cementing business ties through marriages between his family and commercial families in strategic locations. Daniel Gomez, for instance, first married Rebecca de Torres in Jamaica, and after she passed away, then married Esther Levy of Curacao, while David, Isaac, and Benjamin bolstered the family's connections in Barbados with marriages to brides from that island. The Gomez has expanded on these traditional methods of building and securing wealth by also embracing unique opportunities avail available to them in their base of operations in New York uh, in the 18th century. Uh, there they participated in the fur trade with Native Americans in Albany and real estate investment throughout the colony. Perhaps to gain uh, easier access to the supply of, of uh, furs, uh, Gomez and Sons purchased approximately 4,000 acres of land in the Mid-Hudson Valley in the 1710s and the 1720s. This property then seemed to have served as a base of operations uh, for their um, activities economic activities in, in the Hudson Valley, uh, where they established mills and gathered commodities for the provisioning business. And here on, on, on this slide, you can see uh, the, their original um, house, which was expanded on uh, by subsequent owners. And today, uh, this house is called the Gomez Mill House, and it's uh, listed in the National Register of Historical Places um, in Marlborough, New York. Like many Jewish settlers uh, in other Atlantic locations, the Gomez's distinguished themselves by providing services that helped both their home colony and the larger colonial project of the empire in which they resided. For example, New York's assembly met at Mordechai Gomez's Greenwich Village home, which is outside of, uh, of the, uh, the, the, um, the city limits, so to speak, uh, due to a smallpox uh, scare in New York City in 1746. Uh, in 1753, the assembly awarded Daniel Gomez 30 pounds, quote, for translating and interpreting several letters, papers, and other Spanish writings for the governor and council of this colony for the year 1734 to the year 1751. By the time Louis Moses Gomez's youngest son, Benjamin, passed away in 1772, the family had a well-known reputation for, quote, its upright character and benevolent disposition to all peoples and denominations in New York City. Uh, though not a merchant herself, Abigail Levy Franks is another of the well-known Jewish inhabitants of 18th century New York. Abigail Le Levy uh, was a daughter of Moses Levy, who was, who was a, a, a considerable merchant who owned multiple ships uh, in New York. And um, Abigail married Jewish emigrant from England, Jacob Franks in 1712. Um, Abigail Levy Franks has subsequently, I think, be become perhaps most famous for her surviving letters, uh, which provide a window into the mentality of, um, of an elite Jewish woman dedicated to her religion in a predominantly Protestant world. Um, her letters, along with her husband's business records though, also detail the transatlantic commercial world of New York's Jewish merchants. Uh, the Franks participated in the slave trade. They imported sugar, tobacco, and other commodities to New York. 
and they often conducted long distance trade when possible with relatives in ports of the, in other ports of the Atlantic world. Uh, and in a strategy that uh, Jews have been employing for centuries, the Franks sent sons to key locations like London and developing markets like Philadelphia to oversee family business interests in person. While the Gomez's and Franks uh, were among the wealthiest New York Jewish families, a few dozen other lesser known, uh, at least lesser known today, Jewish merchants also helped link New York to the developing Atlantic world of this era. Uh, New York's Jewish merchants imported European products and what they called India goods, cotton, silk, calico, spices through agents in London. Many of these goods were sold in the city, but some were shipped upriver to Albany, where uh, a few Jewish individuals and partners had retail stores. Lyon, Levy, and company, for example, advertised uh, in newspapers that products sold in their Albany store were, quote, as cheap as in New York. Um, from Rhode Island, uh, New York uh, Jewish importers brought in fine hard soap, dipped and molded tallow candles, spermaceti candles, and many, many hogsheads of rum. Rum uh, was one of the key transatlantic commodities of the 18th century uh, it, that linked the Caribbean, North America, South America, Europe, and Africa. And New York's merchants, not only uh, did they bring in rum from Rhode Island, they handled rum from Barbados, from Jamaica, uh, Boston and other, other locations. Among the incredibly diverse list of other commodities that Jewish merchants imported to New York were oil, anchovies, capers, pickles, almonds, currants, raisins. I, the list is, uh, is short, but it, it, relatively short, but it's anything you could think of, lemons, oranges, caraway seed, paper, uh, Tenerife wine, Irish butter, coffee, pepper barrel beef, cordials, cinnamon water, um, et cetera, Virginia tobacco. Uh, cocoa uh, is another one. Uh, Jewish merchants in New York seem to have been major cocoa and chocolate importers. And they do this through co-religionist trading partners in Jamaica, Barbados, Suriname, and Curacao. When you think about Curacao, Curacao is not really a, um, an island that produces uh, cash commodities, but located very closely to the Spanish main. Uh, and, um, and so the, the cocoa that's going through Curacao is likely coming from today's Venezuela. So just thinking about uh, the way uh, commodities uh, and, uh, and Jewish merchants in different ports are, are, are linking things together in the Atlantic world. Human beings, were perhaps the most important commodity uh, in the 18th century Atlantic. And New York Jewish merchants participated in the trafficking of enslaved people from the Caribbean. Some even engaged in direct traffic with Africa to buy enslaved people. Isaac Levy, for example, was a partner, uh, I believe with three uh, Christian New Yorkers in the 1721 Crown Galley voyage that went to Madagascar. Uh, and then uh, delivered slaves first to Brazil and ended up um, bringing 117 slaves to uh, the port in New York City at the end of the voyage. New York's wealthiest Jewish settlers, like their Protestant neighbors, also um, owned enslaved laborers. Um, a 1750 inventory of the state of Mordechai Gomez, for instance, reveals that he owned six um, slaves at the time of his death. New York's Jewish merchants exported provisioning items, including flour and corn, fish, butter, and fruits. Uh, as mentioned before, they engaged in the fur trade. Um, they also seem to have developed a niche business of supplying horses to their co-religionists in Suriname. Another aspect of the economy that some New York Jewish merchants participated in was the provisioning of British military forces. Oh, um, in particular, this was the case 
in the late 1750s and early 1760s when New York became the North American headquarters for Britain during the Seven Years' War. Advertisements in city newspapers highlight how these merchants had provisions, quote, suitable for gentlemen of the army or sea officers. Some pursued opportunities that arose in war further, securing contracts with the British military and traveling with their conquering forces. Aaron Hart, originally of London, provides a great example of how New York Jews utilized their transatlantic connections and advantageous location in New York to prosper individually while advancing the interests of their fellow Jews, and ultimately linking new communities economically and religiously. In 1760, 36-year-old Hart secured a position as a civilian commissary with the British Army that had just taken Quebec and Montreal. And he traveled from New York to Trois Riveries to supply troops, which you can see is up here on the right corner of this map along the St. Lawrence River. As war gave way to peace, Hart remained there supplying foodstuffs and manufactured goods to other merchants and the French Canadian population through both wholesale and retail operations. In conjunction with his brother Moses Hart, who settled in Montreal here uh, by way of New York, um, Aaron also began acquiring real estate, including large land holdings along the St. Lawrence River, which made them landlords to several French Catholic farm families. At a time when it was estimated that there were only 133 male Protestant civilians in the region from Montreal to Quebec, Aaron Hart and at least 17 other adult Jewish men all moved from New York to Canada and comprised a loyal population who the vastly outnumbered British authorities could rely upon. As a measure of this trust, his status, and his language skills, Aaron Hart was appointed postmaster of Tra uh, Riveries in late summer 1763. Among the co-religionists Hart did business with were a group of merchants and fur traders who moved from Albany to Canada in 1760. After the fall of Montreal, the Albany merchants, including the cousins Ezekiel Solomons, Levy Solomons, Chapman Abraham, Benjamin Lyon, and Gershon Levy, saw an opportunity to capture a share of the Great Lakes fur trade that had previously been monopolized by French traders. Uh, because of their prior experience with the fur trade in New York, British officials welcomed their efforts. The men organized themselves into a partnership called Gershon Levy and Company and then divided responsibilities for the success of their enterprise. Benjamin Lyon was to remain behind in Montreal um, and to establish a base and secure supplies and customers from Montreal to Albany. The rest of the men set out for the Great Lakes with a large quantity of trade goods, including wine, brandy, rum, muskets, and gunpowder. Levy Solomon's destination was Fort Niagara. Chapman Abraham traveled to Detroit, while Ezekiel Solomon's and Gershon Levy went to Michilimackinac in today's Michigan. Well, they had this well-planned uh, uh, and they were, uh, had all this uh, expertise, um, but the joint venture was a disaster. Uh, in the summer of 1763, Native Americans took them prisoner, took all four of them prisoner uh, during Pontiac's war. Eventually they were released, but they lost their trade goods, which uh, were of a considerable um, amount of money. And that left them indebted to suppliers in Montreal and New York. Gershon Levy drops out of his surviving historical record after the governor of Quebec, Guy Carleton, denied his firm um, the ability to declare bankruptcy in early 1768. But Chapman Abraham, Benjamin Lyon, Levy Solomon, and Ezekiel Solomon continued to deal in furs and could all be found splitting time between Montreal, New York, and present-day Michigan during the 1770s. Though the context is very different, Newport, Rhode Island, like Canada, is another example of a location where Jewish merchants from New York saw opportunity, moved, made themselves useful to colonial authorities, 
and the larger project of empire, and thus expanded the Jewish presence in North America while strengthening ties to the hub in New York. Newport became an important outfitting uh, uh, center during the Imperial Wars of the 18th century, just as New York had. Um, that helped to spur the town's growth. Uh, moreover, by the 1740s, regular trade, regular direct trade with London uh, was established, uh, um, making Newport a competitive alternate entrepot to Boston. Uh, these factors, along with Newport's expanding North American coastal trade, led New York City merchants to try to cement their commercial ties to the town. Some, including a number of Jewish merchants, took residency in Newport to help facilitate the growing trade relationship between the two ports during this period. Um, Moses Lopez, I, I like to, to uh, mention specific um, examples of, uh, of these Jewish merchants and Moses Lopez is a really good one. He's um, the half brother of perhaps the more famous Lopez, Aaron Lopez, but he was among the first Sephardic merchants to make the move from New York City to Newport in the 1740s. So a little bit about Moses Lopez's background. Uh, he was uh, baptized as Jose in Lisbon um, before leaving Portugal for London in 1726. There, Jose lived with his Spanish-born cousins, the Rivera family, and began to practice Judaism openly. In keeping with Inquisition-era Sephardic tradition, Jose took a Hebrew name, Moses, once he was able to worship freely as a Jew. Soon thereafter, Moses Lopez and the Rivera family migrated to New York City, where he there married his cousin, Rebecca Rodriguez Rivera. Moses and his father-in-law, Abraham Rodriguez Rivera, acquired denizen status and began to engage in commercial endeavors in New York City, and both were eventually naturalized as English subjects in 1741. By 1743, Moses Lopez and Abraham Rodriguez Rivera, along with their families, could be found in Newport, Rhode Island. The opportunity to participate in the town's growing commercial emporium must have been the impetus behind Moses Lopez's decision to go to Newport. But once there, he made an effort to ingratiate himself with Rhode Island's leadership by offering his services as a translator. He was proficient in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. And therefore, Moses Lopez utilized these language uh, abilities to carve out a special place for himself in the colony as an extremely useful intermediary. Eventually, he asked the government for a tax break as compensation for the many documents he had translated on behalf of the colony. And in August 1750, the General Assembly of Rhode Island uh, did allocate that tax break for him. Uh, Moses Lopez was also skilled in the manufacture of potash, a chemical that was important in the production of glass, soap, and fertilizer. Aware of the fact that he possessed a unique and valuable knowledge set, um, Lopez sought to protect and control this source of strength and profit. He petitioned the colonial, uh, colonial officials to grant him a monopoly on potash production in Rhode Island. And again, the Rhode Island General Assembly agreed and gave him an exclusive 10-year contract for the manufacture of this product in the colony. Moses Lopez's work translating documents and his skill in manufacturing potash both illustrate the characteristic of a successful Jewish settlement in the Atlantic world. Jews succeeded in establishing themselves in a given locale by making themselves useful to a larger community. Whether it was the ability to supply products and goods from otherwise difficult to reach markets or their unique linguistic and cultural expertise, Jews created a niche for themselves as indispensable brokers and intermediaries. Many Jews like Moses Lopez understood that knowledge was a valuable commodity in the Atlantic world and the power they could derive from it often enabled them to thrive in North America. From the 1740s to the eve of the American Revolution, Newport's Jewish population rose to 25 families and a total of about 200 people. Again, many of them having come first from New York City. Uh, and here you can see the now very famous Toro Synagogue that was uh, completed in 1763. Uh, and so New York's, uh, excuse me, Newport's uh, Jewish community um, was worshiping there until 
uh, the city was occupied by uh, British forces during the um, American War for Independence. So far uh, in tonight's talk, I've focused, uh, of course, on uh, commercial endeavors of uh, New York's Jewish community. For the remainder of my time, I'd like to turn our attention to their religious activities and the development of New York as a spiritual capital of 18th century North American Jewry. Under uh, the Dutch West India Company rule, Jews could worship privately in their own homes, but like other religious minorities in New Netherland, they were prohibited from building or otherwise designating a structure as a synagogue. Dutch Reformed Protestantism was the only religion afforded the privilege of public worship. In English New York, however, Jews and numerous Protestant denominations received permission to construct houses of worship. While there were a few brief moments in the subsequent colonial history of New York where Jews faced some restrictions during the government of Jacob Lazar, for example, Overall, New York provided an atmosphere that allowed for a remarkable synagogue-centered community to develop. By the 1760s, upwards of 300 Jews were calling New York their home. In the colonies of the 17th century Atlantic world, Sephardi Jews significantly outnumbered Ashkenazi settlers. As the 18th century progressed though, Ashkenazi migration to the Americas outpaced that of the Sephardim. New York's history mirrors these larger patterns. While Sephardim co uh, comprised the majority of New York's Jewish population in 1700, by the 1720s, Ashkenazis outnumbered Sephardi Jews in the colony. Nevertheless, in the early modern Jewish communities of the Americas, and New York was no exception, Sephardic religious practices predominated. Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews uh, pronounced some Hebrew letters differently, uh, but the basic prayers are the same in Sephardic and Ashkenazi services. The greatest religious differences seem to come during Passover and the high holidays when uh, uh, Sephardic uh, tradition calls for the recitation of certain hymns that Ashkenazi uh, Jews don't um, recite in their services. Overall, I think we can say uh, that um, their religious practices were compatible, um, at least in terms of Jewish worship. On the other hand, in Europe, uh, there's a vast cultural gulf between Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews during the early modern era. Sephardic Jews celebrated their Iberian heritage while often disparaging uh, the German origins of their co-religionists. Uh, in part, uh, in a place like Amsterdam, many of, uh, of the German Jews had come as refugees and, uh, and at least initially did not have uh, uh, the same level of wealth as, uh, as the, um, uh, the Sephardim. However, because of the relatively small population in New York and in other North American location, Jews had to put aside their ethnic and cultural differences and live and worship as one community. Sometimes that was easier said than done as surviving uh, records indicate numerous disputes between Jewish settlers in New York. Um, in the 1680s, Jews in New York City worshiped uh, in a house first on Beaver Street, which if you can see my cursor is right here on this 1695 map. Uh, and then they moved to a house on Mill Street over here. Um, the first Hazan, which um, today we would define as a cantor, but in the early modern era, uh, was certainly a spiritual leader and a religiously trained teacher, though not ordained as a rabbi. Um, so the first um, Hazan for the New York community was Saul Pardo, also known as David Brown, the same person mentioned earlier as having received a license to trade and traffic uh, from Governor Dongan. Pardo was born in Rotterdam and moved to New York from Curacao. 
Uh, he came from a long line of rabbis and his father, Jos Josiah Pardo, was the first rabbi of Curacao. Um, the religious links between New York and Curacao were very strong uh, for this period uh, at the end of the 17th century and throughout the whole first half of, uh, of the 18th century. In the 1720s, New York's Jews employed another Hazan from Curacao, Moza Lopez de Fonseca. Uh, and when Congregation Sheriff Israel planned to build a synagogue on Mill Street, so they had used a building over here, and then um, they decide that they are, their community is growing and they uh, need um, a brand new structure to accommodate um, the expanding population. And so when they decide to do that, the second largest contribution after New York's local Jewish population came from Jews in Curacao. Uh, the first New York born Kazan was Gershom Mendez Satius, who was appointed to the position as a 23-year-old 23, 23 in 1768. Gershom's father was a Portuguese New Christian who had fled that country for London, then had moved to New York. There he married an Ashkenazi woman. So uh, Gershom uh, Mendez Satius uh, represents that mixing of Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews that was commonplace in 18th century North American Jewish communities. I should say that the, um, the first uh, ordained rabbis did not move to New York until the mid 19th century. As New York's Jewish population grew at the beginning of the 18th century, Congregation Sheriff Israel established rules for governing all aspects of Jewish life in the colony, both inside and outside the synagogue. In this way, New York replicated practices that uh, were seen in earlier Jewish communities on both sides of the Atlantic. According to historian Jonathan Sarna, like Congregation Mikveh Israel, which is in Curacao, and the parent congregation Gahal Kadosh Talmud Torah in Amsterdam, Congregation Sheriff Israel in New York, quote, assumed responsibility for all aspects of religious, Jewish religious life, communal worship, dietary laws, life cycle events, education, philanthropy, ties to Jews around the world, oversight of the cemetery and the ritual bath, unquote. The earliest New York Jewish community regulations were written in 1706, though they are no longer extant. The oldest surviving minute book uh, of Sheriff Israel dates to 1728. And um, that one is interesting that it's written in English and in Portuguese. Um, it details the activities of the congregation's executive committee. And just as in other uh, communities uh, in the Atlantic world, Congregation Sheriff Israel's executive committee was comprised of the city's leading Jewish merchants. In that year that the, the, the first surviving minute book, uh, 1728, Louis Moses Gomez was elected the Parnas or president of the synagogue while his son, Daniel Gomez was named first assistant. New York's executive committee also had the authority to elect its next members and so possessed um, the ability uh, to establish an oligarchical organization uh, dominated by the colony's wealthiest Jewish merchants. According to the 1728 records, the executive committee's primary function was to regulate internal synagogue affairs, assigning seats and taxes to congregation members and preventing disputes from erupting within the walls of the actual synagogue. And again, the records show that they weren't always successful in preventing disputes from occurring even during, uh, during um, worship. Uh, they were also charged with providing poor relief and instructed to try to warn away impoverished Jews uh, from the city. As mentioned a few moments ago in 1730, Congregation Sheriff Israel bought land on Mill Street uh, where they had, again, had utilized a structure as a synagogue. And this time they intended in 1730 to build a new two-story synagogue which they did dedicate uh, during Passover in 1730, which is depicted here. I'm not certain how accurately, but uh, this is uh, always uh, 
represents the 1730 synagogue. Um, the new synagogue drew from the example of the London building, which in turn was inspired by Amsterdam Sephardic synagogue and included a balcony and separate entrance for women. The Torah, Torah was read from the center of the sanctuary and the wealthiest congregants like uh, congregation President Jacob Franks in 1730 purchased seats on benches. Those with less means stood during services. Just as New York emerged as a center of Jewish commercial activity in the 18th century, with its merchants forging strong ties to other port communities in North America, Congregation Sheriff Israel also became the center of Jewish practice in North America during this era. North American Jews from as far away as Halifax in Nova Scotia would make special trips to New York during the high holidays to attend services at Congregation Sheriff Israel Synagogue. Experience uh, ritual um, slaughterers and moils traveled from New York to provide their services in nascent Jewish communities like Newport and Montreal. Congregation Sheriff Israel's members also provided funds to help Newport's Jews complete the construction of their synagogue, which I showed earlier in the early 1760s, again known today as Toro Synagogue. Finally, highlighting the continuing influence of New York's community on its sister congregations in North America. As late as 1857, Montreal's Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, also known as, as Sheriff Israel, decreed that, quote, the hours for commencing services were to be the same as in the Portuguese synagogue in New York. In conclusion, uh, following the English conquest of New Netherland, Jewish merchants moved to the colony and utilized their extensive trade connections throughout the Atlantic world to develop New York into another node in a series of Jewish networks that transcended colonial boundaries and bridged empires. These efforts, along with their willingness to provide services in the interests of New York, like translating foreign language documents, endeared Jewish settlers to authorities and enabled them to secure privileges to trade and carve out a space for their religious community. From this North American base in New York, Jewish merchants spread to other locations, in particular Newport and the St. Lawrence River Valley in Canada, linking these places economically and spiritually. Significantly, their actions helped to shape the development of the Atlantic world and in the process made New York a center of North American Jewry. So um, thank you for, for listening and I think um, we'll, we'll do some questions. By the way, this is, uh, this is in the collection of the John Carter Brown Library and it is the, uh, the first um, Jewish prayer book that was printed uh, in the Americas. And uh, of course it was printed in New York City and translated by a, a merchant that, uh, that had moved there from, from Curacao. Thank you so much, Noah. This was wonderful. We do have a question and answer period. I know there was one person during the presentation who wanted to know the uh, provenance of the map of New Netherland at the beginning and, and was asking what the source was. This is a, a 1660 map. If I could uh, actually call on, on David Voorhees, he could probably uh, more clearly let us know exactly um, who produced this map. But this is one you always see uh, depicting New Amsterdam. It's a, it's a redraft of a Costello plan. I, I, I'm not sure if this is by Stokes. I think it's always, uh, uh, somebody else, but it's, it's, a, it's a redraft done in, uh, in the uh, early 20th century. Okay, right. Uh, Thanks, and David. Anne, uh, Anne, who asked the question, wanted to know about the one to the left. <laughs> so, of course. Oh, I, well, yeah. this, you know, this one, um, if uh, it, it, it actually, there is uh, some credit uh, in the bottom there. But to be honest with you, uh, obviously, the 17th and 18th centuries, um, there aren't, uh, you know, a lot of images to draw on. And, and so I, when I put um, PowerPoints together, I search for you know appropriate um, appropriate images, and this is one I found that I really like because um, it shows the larger New Netherland, um, you know, with the um, the Connecticut River uh, boundary, and uh, 
And I don't know how accurate this is over here because this looks like modern, you know, Pennsylvania, but I like it because again, it shows a very large New Netherland. Um, and, uh, but I don't, I don't recall where I got that from. Okay, thank you. Um, another Anne would like to know, are there any of these synagogues that are still standing that, that you spoke about? Well, um, Mikveh Israel in, uh, in um, Curacao is the oldest um, continually used uh, synagogue building in the Americas. And so th that one is pretty amazing if you ever have a chance to go to Curacao. I, I did um, a few years ago and uh, it's, um, that one was built uh, again on the model of the, um, of the Amsterdam Sephardic uh, uh, synagogue of the 17th century. And they have sand on the floor. And as I described for the, for the New York um, uh, synagogue that was built on Mill Street, the, uh, the sort of bima where they um, have services and where the Torah is put is in the middle um, of, of the sanctuary. Uh, so that one is, um, is uh, right, still functioning. Um, it's the oldest. In terms of, of the United States or what's now the United States, uh, Newport's um, you know, Toro Synagogue, which I have an image of, mm -hmm. um, is, is the oldest surviving building. Although you know, for, for a time, again, uh, it, it, it wasn't functioning as uh, Jews evacuated uh, Newport um, during the revolution and, and then the port didn't re resume sort of its um, prominent place in, in uh, the Atlantic economy coming out of the revolution. And so the, the, the congregation really dwindled and, and it, it sort of wasn't used, but it's obviously made an incredible comeback here uh, uh, in the 20th and 21st century. In New York, um, I believe the oldest um, continually used synagogue building is in Troy. Oh, wow. uh, upstate, um, which uh, I think is from 1870. Um, so that's kind of interesting because Sheriff Israel in, in New York City obviously uh, continued to move north, right, as the city grew. And, and, and I think many, uh, many people that are um, tuned in tonight know that uh, of their, their very nice building on Central Park West, mm -hmm. uh, but that isn't quite as old as this uh, synagogue in Troy. Um, and speaking of synagogues, again, the building uh, doesn't exist anymore, but uh, in terms of New York, um, the, the co a congregation did form in Albany um, in the 1830s. And apparently they did um, uh, designate a building around 1838 uh, uh, for, for worship. Great, so thank you. Um, Susan says, thank you so much. I am the vice president of Gomez Millhouse Foundation. So your presentation was so exciting for us. But I am curious, what were the disputes that broke out in the synagogue between the Sephardim and the Ashkenazi? Uh, well, these, uh, they, they can be over, um, uh, you know, issues that weren't necessarily, necessarily um, uh, religiously based um, that, uh, uh, sort of resentments, um, you know, business deals, uh, sort of um, outside the synagogue, but uh, people uh, seem to uh, sometimes um, have an opportunity to confront uh, uh, the other person while at synagogue. I know um, in uh, in reading um, about uh, about the congregation that uh, apparently. At one point during services, I want to say Yom Kippur, but uh, but at any event, while services were going on, apparently there was a window that was open and uh, and rain was getting in. Somebody shut the window, but it was too hot, and so somebody opened it, and then another person went up and right, and, and so this led to 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 actually a shouting match during during services. So it could be for a variety variety of reasons. Um, uh, often that you know are not again about um, about actual spiritual or uh, or religious matters, um, but the, again these these merchants had conducted so much business with each other that um, they're often suing one another when when the deals uh, don't go as planned. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, and those kind of resentments again can can um, be presented um, at, at synagogue. Okay, thank you. It's kind of nice to hear people in history acted a little bit like some of some of the things we hear about these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was met, when I was, I was sort of the end talking about this executive committee and they're having this, you know, establishing regulations for for conduct within and without um, the synagogue. You know, I, I, part of I think what they're doing is is trying to um, to get people to comport themselves in a respectful manner during uh, you know when services are being conducted. And and I just think about you know growing up uh, and attending uh, you know synagogue uh, a, a, you know as a teenager and just seeing people talking right during services and thinking you know what are you doing uh, having a conversation uh, that's not what we're here for. And so I imagine that sort of thing, uh, you know, was taking place in these um, synagogues in the 17th and 18th century, 17th if we're talking about Brazil, 18th century, you know, in, in New York. Well, it's not on the topic, but I can tell you personally, it takes place in churches too. <laughs> um, Barry wants to know, where did the ordained rabbis have congregations before they came to New York? Well, the, the ones that came in the mid uh, the, the mid uh, 19th century uh, were, were German uh, uh, Jews, and so um, uh, they would have been in in, in central uh, in Central Europe. Uh, those that um, traveled to Dutch Brazil and Curaçao and Suriname uh, um, were uh, ordained in, in Amsterdam as that community grew in the um, in the 17th century. There uh, was, um, you know, an, a time uh, um, school, and uh, there, this became a center of, um, of um, you know, uh, religious scholarship and and uh, and you know, Jewish theology. And so, uh, rabbis were ordained there um, for um, as, you know, especially those that went to uh, to Curacao and and uh, Suriname. Okay, great, thank you. And David Voorhees would like to know, um, Noah, you mentioned that there was a period of hostility against Jews during Leisler's administration. Can you expand on this? That was well, my question. Yeah, um, there is, uh, I, I think a moment when, uh, when, when Leisler is uh, in control of, or you know, seemingly in control of the colony where, uh, I think they issue um, an edict that only, um, Reform Protestantism uh, uh, can be officially worshipped, and um, and so c Catholics and Jews are um, prevented from uh, worshiping publicly, at least on paper. Um, and and uh, again, this is really David's field, and and so I'm curious uh, if he um, has uh, you know further explanation or or wants to counter that. No, that's why I'm interested because I don't know much. I mean, this is this is something that uh, it was uh, that, uh, certainly against Roman Catholics. I mean, there was there was huge hostility against Roman Catholics and um, throughout the whole throughout the whole colony. But uh, that, that, I don't know anything about the about this um, against Jews, and I'm I'm fascinated by you know yeah, um, learning more about it. That's why I asked. Okay, uh, William um, Pensack, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name uh, properly, was, was a historian out of Penn State, and he wrote about Jewish communities in North America. And in his interpretation of that Lizer period, suggested that this was issued, but perhaps not enforced, or perhaps there wasn't enough time before Lizer lost power. Uh, uh, for um, for for really a, a crackdown, but but there is um, there is a um, a surviving uh, you know um, archival source that that uh, that that does say that the Jews were and Catholics were going to be prevented from from being able to worship. All right. And Eliza says, "Thank you very much. I enjoyed the program." Our family are members of Sherath Israel and appreciate listening. My family was also from the Turo Synagogue in Newport before the revolution, and then there again much later in the late 19th century. 
Um, so there's not a question in that, but I appreciate the comment and maybe you want to say something about it, but I did want to know also about the Turo Synagogue. What, what is there going on there now? You said it's not currently operating as a synagogue? Oh, no. It, oh, oh, it very much is. There was okay. a time when, uh, when, again, there wasn't um, enough of a Jewish population there at, coming out of the revolution that, uh, that, that people, people left um, for the Caribbean or um, for other, uh, other North American locations. But it definitely um, it came back in the 20th century and now in the 21st century. Uh, let me just look at the image uh, um, or, or show us the image uh, because there is to the left, uh, if, if we could expand this out, there is another building that is now uh, a museum um, and a center for religious toleration. I think it's, uh, it's called, it has something to do with, with um, a former senator named Loeb uh, mm. uh, that um, was involved or perhaps in donating the money. So it's, it might be called the Loeb Center for Religious Toleration or something. I don't have the, the, those notes in front of me, but so the actual synagogue um, it does have services. I know for sure during the summer, I think sometimes, uh, it, you, you know, the, the Jewish community in Newport um, is smaller during the winter months. So I, I'm not 100% um, up on what's happening year round, but I know for sure in the summer. And years ago, when I was um, a grad student and I had a fellowship at the John Carter Brown Library, um, I gave a talk at the synagogue on a Friday night. So there, it was, it was kind of neat. There were services uh, and then I, I talked afterwards. So that um, I want to say was in May. So certainly, but this was, you know, in very, a number, as David reminded us of how long it's been since I was at NYU, um, this was a number of years ago. But I, I, I know that at least part, part time during the year, they have services, maybe all year. Okay. All right. And Susan is asking both you and David. Don't you think Leisler's prohibition was really aimed at non-reformed Dutch Protestants like the Anglicans? I suspect Catholics and Jews were not the primary target. Well, again, I'm going to hand that off to David in a second, um, but I know that he, I suspect he is going to, to say that, that Leisler was very anti-Catholic, um, but I'm going to let him, uh, as the expert on Leisler, answer that. Um, well, Liza was a millenarian, and like many millenarians in this, in this period, they believed that the second coming, or the, the thousand years leading to the second coming was imminent, and so the, the, they were trying to purify the, 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 Christian, the Christian church toward, toward that end. Uh, my feeling had been about when it came to, to Jews was more like in, today, in line with today's, today's uh, conservative Christians who have a certain alliance with the Jewish community for certain biblical reasons. And I, 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 I just feel that the whole topic needs a lot much greater explora uh, exploration. Um, I know that Liza is particularly hostile. I don't want to get into the, to all the divisions that were going on within the, the, the religious community and the religious world at the time, which was also happening within Judaism as well. As you know, the growth of the Hasidic movement and the, and the uh, reform, the beginnings of reformed uh, Judaism. But um, that uh, Liza was particularly hostile toward Quakers and, and Jews and, and other groups that were, were moving away from what they believed was traditional Christianity. I don't know if that answers the question or not. It's it's a complex issue that needs a lot more exploration. And I do know, and now you and I have looked into this, that, that Liza did did trade with certain members of the Jewish community. I know when we were going through names, we found I know that Asher Levy, for example, he appears in the accounts with with Liza. So um, I think it's a topic that's fascinating, and we need to know a lot more about it. Great. Um, Eliza gives us some more information on the Turo Synagogue. 
Yes, my great great grandmother, Eliza de Sola, who married Rabbi Abra Abraham Pereira, I probably, I think I said it wrong, at Mendez, were at Turo Synagogue. He was asked to be the rabbi from London. Turo today does, does have a vibrant congregation and visitor center. We also have the George Washington letter reading every August. Washington came there and wrote the famous letter to bigotry, no sanction, to persecution, no assistance. After the letter of Benjamin Sachs, which is also read each year. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Great. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's a, a very significant moment um, mm -hmm. that is uh, that historians often talk about in the development of uh, you know separation of church and state uh, and um, mm -hmm. uh, in the United States coming out of the the revolution and um, no religious tests and. Washington recognizing the, the importance of um, Jewish contributions to, uh, uh, you know, to the to the revolution and uh, to the new United States and and I, and that was a, clearly a big moment for um, for the, the Jewish population to to have that um, statement by George Washington. Okay, great. So if there are no more questions. Um, and we're getting thank yous from the participants. So I second their motion. Thank you so much, Noah. And thank you as always, David, for another great Leisler event. It was really wonderful. Thank you all. Okay, thank you.